so yeah, the mandate I was given is, uh, is it too late to buy the commodity boom? So we're going to kind of investigate commodity markets uh, today. Um, yeah, just to run you through what we'll talk about. I'm just going to start uh, pretty simply uh, about, uh, you know, investing in commodities, what are commodities, why do you want to invest in them, uh, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, just pull that across. Um, yeah, so then we'll just look at uh, kind of how do you actually invest in commodities. So a little bit of the practical mechanics around investing in commodities and the different ways that you can get exposure. We'll have a look at general commodity markets uh, today and what's going on, and then obviously try and answer that question. Is it too late to get involved? And that's where I'll have to make some calls uh, right at the end so that you have to stay on for the hour. Um, yeah, it is obviously, I mean, the, the rides have been spectacular, but uh, first of all, before we get started, uh, why should you listen to us? Um, first of all, I'm not a geologist. I'm not a, a professional commodity arbitrage trader. I'm just a humble portfolio manager. Uh, we have to kind of take commodities as inputs into our calls, but uh, what do we do? Uh, I obviously am one of the directors at Rand Swiss, uh, along with Wolf Govender, um, and we run a diversified financial services firm, which means we link a whole lot of different people together. We do everything from online trading, private broking, managed portfolios, all under our stock broking business. We uh, launch structured products. We do uh, offshore transfers. We've obviously got uh, Yaku as the certified financial planner. We've got some wealth, wealth business as well, and tax-free savings accounts. So that's kind of like our, our business. Um, and obviously commodities, like especially to the managed portfolios, which I run, and, and obviously we've got a lot of uh, our private broking clients that will ask us uh, these questions all the time, uh, because commodity prices are just so important to, to understand uh, where, you know, where and how to invest. Uh, it's, uh, it's an input to so many different uh, aspects of, of uh, financial markets. Um, how did we rank? How do we do? Why should you listen to us? Uh, currently, we are, are ranked the number one securities broker in South Africa, which is I'm incredibly happy with, and that's why I put it on every presentation that I can, mainly because we beat some of the big uh, banks and most of the other stockbrokers we competed at are, are massive listed companies, and we're a much smaller firm. Uh, so I'm really happy with that, that we are currently ranked uh, number number one. Um, you know, we didn't just rank as number one, we've also got a whole lot of other kind of awards as well. So top tax free savings uh, provider in South Africa two years in a row. So if you want that kind of stuff, come chat to us. Uh, People's Choice Award voted, to, uh, voted by our clients. Uh, so the guys that are listening to our calls and chatting to us uh, do seem to like us, which is obviously a good thing. Uh, and then obviously that, that overall award as well. So hopefully that builds a little bit of credibility, even though I'm not a geologist or even a farmer. So um, it gives you hopefully a little bit of credibility to, to listen to me when I talk about commodities. So let's start with, with really the basics. And I just want to go through investing commo in commodities, the, like 101. What is a commodity? How does a commodity differ from, from stocks and bonds and all of that? Um, and really the, the, the most basic definition that you can get of a commodity is a commodity is an economic good, usually a resource that has uh, full or substantial fungibility. Now, that probably doesn't explain much if you don't know what fungible means. Uh, anyone that's uh, kind of dabbled in the crypto markets will probably have an idea uh, as to what fungibility means. Um, but essentially fungibility is individual units are essentially interchangeable. So when most people think about commodities, they're probably thinking about raw materials or basic resources. So if you have actually done economics 101, you'll probably have heard of something called the factors of production of which resources are one. Any good and service you know, usually relies on resources and input. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about commodity markets. Now commodity markets can be those kind of very basic commodities, but they can be things as complex as semiconductors, anything that almost the becomes fungible. It's a process of, called commoditization. Um, once something is commoditized, you, you have almost this interchangeable unit and, and there's no, there, you, there's no um, kind of brand differentiation. It's just a, a stock standard product that, that has almost a, you know, I want to say like an international ruling price, but obviously, you know, big bulk commodities, their prices uh, are slightly different because of transport costs. But essentially, you know, one unit of this is the same as another unit and that you can't tell the difference. So I thought I'll chuck in a Karl Marx quote for you as well. So, so Karl Marx, uh, you know, obviously uh, he said, uh, from the taste of wheat, it is not possible to tell who produced it, a Russian serf, a French peasant, or an English capitalist. Now, that, that really is uh, why wheat is a commodity, because you cannot tell uh, one wheat from another, uh, basically. So inside the commodity markets, uh, there's a couple of different definitions that are probably quite important to understand. When we talk about commodities, we're not just talking about, uh, you know, what, what, what a lot of people think of commodities. I don't know what you guys think of commodities. So a lot of people think gold is a commodity, uh, iron ore, metals, tin, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, but commodities are broadly divided into to hard commodities and soft commodities. So what do what is the difference between a hard commodity and a soft commodity? Hard commodity is generally mined, a soft commodity is grown. 
You can normally eat a soft commodity and you shouldn't be eating hard commodities. So platinum, rhodium, palladium, iron ore, oil. Now you can further subdivide this into the energy complex. You can subdivide it into grains and, and oil seeds and all sorts of different things. But those are the big uh, kind of definitions of, of commodity pricing, uh, or at least uh, you know, how you would split uh, commodities at least. Um, so why do people want to invest in commodities? Why have is everyone on this call decided to attend and, and learn about investing in commodities? Uh, now, there's a couple of different reasons. And uh, first of all, I think you know, you've got to remember that the commodity markets are actually a lot older than stock markets or bond markets. Uh, commodity markets go way back to kind of silk and spices. And you know, long before there was such a thing as a, a bond or a piece of paper or a share in a company, uh, commodities were traded. And I think it, it's it's because of this very primary and basic nature of commodities that they that they attract retail investors specifically. People like the idea of commodities, especially you know if, if someone has no idea uh, about investments in the investment world, um, they're automatically almost drawn to to the commodity side of it because it's something physical that you can understand. A share is a share can be quite abstract uh, in that uh, you, know, you you are you deserve a portion of profits of a company. A bond, you know, where you basically lending someone money and they're going to pay you back a coupon. That that can be tricky for a new investor to understand. Um, why, whereas a commodity is easy. Oh, I get a lump of gold, and you know, gold can go up or down, and that's how I'm going to make a return. So, that's that's I think it's the simplicity, the the perceived, and I put the the, the, the perception there, the, the perceived simplicity um, that they are easily understood. Uh, which is maybe not always the case. Um, and then also because of, you know, in a way because of the volatility as well. So, you know, as we've seen in, in kind of crypto markets, uh, very volatile markets or markets that move, uh, you know, dramatically and have speculators in the market, they tend to do well in retail markets specifically because there's something that people chat about around the bri. Oh, I bought some silver contract or I've got a gold coin. Have you seen what, what's going on with this? Or, you know, look at what's happening in coal prices. You know, I managed to get some coal contracts or, you know, I bought an oil ETF or whatever the case is. And, and, and there's, because of this huge volatility, there's kind of those very short term, very aggressive swings that uh, you know, will far outperform, you know, like a standard money market product or, or even just a, a normal equity portfolio because the volatility is just so high. What does that mean? It means like there's this FOMO, the, the word gets around and word of mouth, everyone suddenly wants to get in, in, involved, even though they maybe don't have the, the necessary understanding. So those big, big uh, swings up, um, tend to attract retail investors. And, and that's why I think people are, you know, the, the average man on the street actually often starts their investment journey uh, in the commodity markets rather than in, in kind of the formal stock markets or, or in, in a bond market. Um, but that's not to say that professional advisors and, and professional traders don't use commodities in, in all sorts of different ways. So uh, I've kind of split the two and I'm trying to make the distinction here. So why do professional advisors uh, use commodities in portfolios? Now, uh, probably one of the most important reasons to use commodities when building out, if you're a, 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 like an a independent financial advisor, is uh, you want to add commodities to a client's portfolio because you're looking for a non-correlated return. Um, and by getting a non-correlated return into a client's portfolio, what you're doing is you're actually dropping the level of risk. So if you've got a, a client that's got 30 or 40% in equity, they've got 20% 20, 20 in bonds, and you're looking, looking for a way to kind of flesh out the rest of the portfolio, commodities suddenly become very attractive because they behave differently uh, to, to standard equity markets and bond markets. They often, there's like a lead, either lead lag relationship, but, but different commodities can have very, very uh, non-correlated uh, returns. So, so as an extension of that, not just looking for non-correlated returns, um, it also gives you, a, you know, a powerful diversification because it's not just that they are negative correlation. It's not just that, you know, buying gold in a portfolio, for example, where if markets are falling, you expect it to go the other way. It's that, you know, some commodities are just not correlated to markets at all. Markets could be going up, they could be going up. Markets could be falling, they could still be going up. Uh, you just don't know. And it's that kind of non-correlated nature that you're looking for. But the, the ultimate intention of a financial advisor would be to diversify a, a client's portfolio. Now, obviously very topical at the moment, the other huge benefit of commodities is that they act as hedges against inflation. So often buying physical stuff. So what is inflation? Inflation is the general uh, price rise. So it's the general lifting of, of prices in an economy. Um, and one way to protect yourself from, from rising prices is to, to hold physical, you know, whether you hold it physical or buy an ETF, but is to hold hard commodities or, or, or the physical goods, uh, because as they inflate, uh, your portfolio is protected uh, against inflation. Now, um, obviously, that's become very, very topical with the high inflation that we've been experiencing, and we've been seeing commodity markets running on the back of that, which is one of the reasons that we've seen such exciting gains. But 
that inflation hedge uh, component to, to commodities is also uh, an important uh, aspect for, for professional investors to use commodity or commodity linked uh, either companies or ETFs, et cetera, to, to, to add to portfolios, to try and generate uh, that alpha, to try and uh, put their clients in a position or, or try and achieve a, a financial goal. Um, Finally, the volatility, obviously I've said that the, the markets are quite volatile, it can create uh, opportunities for, for very clever, and I've said it, very clever traders. Um, so if you're very, very good at, uh, at kind of playing the, the, that specific commodity market, um, you can do very well because there are often uh, misprices, they, you know, depending on the physical market that you're looking at, but different markets uh, can be quite, quite different. And of course, there are lots of fun for speculators as well. So speculators also, because of the volatility, will have a lot of fun. But generally, you do need to be very clever. And I'm going to kind of uh, extend that uh, idea a little bit further. Um, so before we kind of look at the different ways to invest in commodities, the last thing I want to look at is what is the dangers of investing uh, or trading uh, commodities? So the first is that the generally commodity markets, and it's obviously not, it's not true of every commodity market because some, some commodity markets, you know, can be localized. If you've got um, something that's very expensive to transport, uh, you, you know, even oil to an extent. I mean, you guys all, uh, I'm, I'm hoping know that there's a whole lot of different oil contracts in the world. You get Brent crude oil, and you get West Texas Intermediate, and there's all these different oil contracts because oil actually has different prices depending on where it is in the globe. So you do get the localization uh, aspect of it, but generally to be commoditized, to, to have something that has um, become com a commodity, um, they generally are very, very large markets, very large and generally very efficient. So you've got a lot of participants looking at this price all the time, measuring the, the supply demand dynamics, trying to balance things uh, and, and all making predictions. What happens then is markets tend to become very, very efficient. Um, so then it becomes very difficult in, in an efficient market for you to kind of generate alpha, if you want to put it that way. It's very difficult for you to go and find, as a, certainly as a retail investor, like the angle to say, oh, wheat is too cheap now, it's got to go up, or oil, because there's, the, the market is just so efficient. There's so many very intelligent actors acting in the market. Of course, the other, the other um, aspect of, of the danger of investing in commodities is that they are volatile. And if you consider volatile uh, volatility, at least, as risk, um, then they, they are naturally higher risk. Um, you know, if you, you're a financial advisor sitting with your client, and you're trying to work out how much they're going to need in five years or 10 years or 20 years time at retirement. And you've got this component in your in your different baskets that you're building and that component, you're not sure if it's going to do 50 percent or if it's going to do, you know, if it's going to lose 20 percent. Uh, that makes your job a lot more difficult because there's a lot of uncertainty. That kind of leads us to the next one, which is uh, from an, an analytic point of view. So if you are dealing with a very liquid market, a very volatile market, it really increases forecasting risk. So even if you're an analyst working for a, a mining firm and you're trying to price underlying iron ore prices, it's, you, you have a high degree of forecasting risk. If you're a, an analyst that's covering a mining company and you're trying to put price targets in place, the, the price of their good could be anywhere. And it's very difficult. I mean, you look at the supply demand dynamics in platinum, for example, you go look at like the Johnson Matthew reports, you kind of get a sense of like, if, is the market in surplus or is it in deficit? But, but the point is the forecasting risk is very, very high. Um, so that, that makes it again, very difficult for you to, to effectively predict things in, in commodity markets. And that adds to the, the danger, if you want to put it that way. And then finally, you know, again, it depends how you get access to the markets. And I'm going to look at that in the next couple of slides. But um, if you aren't going via the physical underlying commodity, so if you're not buying a block of gold or you're not going and uh, buying some frozen orange juice concentrate or you're not going and investing directly in, in the wheat price or in silver or whatever the underlying commodity is, um, and instead you're investing in the producer, um, you, you are often you know, you, you, the, the producers are, are mainly price takers. So uh, there's very, you know, OPEC um, is, is kind of one of the very few kind of cartel structures that actually has a significant influence over something like the oil price. But most most uh, commodity companies are, are price takers. They, they're just, you know, if, if the price of their commodity is going up, if you're a farmer and you're planting wheat and there happens to be war in Ukraine and the wheat price happens to spike, well, guess what? You're going to have this windfall profit, but it was totally outside of your control. Um, so the producers have to kind of focus what's, uh, on what's inside their control. And because they're price takers, the actual end product is, is outside their control, very different from, from Apple, for example, that can say, wait, an iPhone 
that costs X amount, that's how much we're gonna to go to the market with it to an extent, they can control the price of their, their good, especially the stronger the brand uh, product has, the, the more control they have over the, the, the ultimate price. Commo just the nature of commoditization takes away the, the control of the price. But um, they've also got all the operational risks as well. So if you're a mining company, uh, you can have labor unrest, uh, people, they, you know, strikes can shut down your mine, you can have uh, dam walls collapse that take out uh, your production, and then you can have your partners sue you. There's a lot, there's a lot that can go wrong. There's a lot that can go wrong uh, from an operational point of view. Mining, you know, mining specifically is a very difficult, uh, very, very highly technical uh, endeavor. Um, of course, you've also got uh, all the, the issues around regulation as well, especially if you're extracting primary uh, minerals from, from an area. Uh, in South Africa, we even have uh, challenges around property rights. So, you know, if you're, even if you're a farmer, there's this kind of risks, uh, risks around what is your actual property worth. Um, so there's all those kind of operational risks that come with owning the underlying provider. Now that is translatable to most other uh, you know, businesses, it's a, it's a business risk, but that risk is, is definitely different from the risk of just owning, you know, physical underlying. So it's important to, I think, make that distinction. Um, that gives you kind of like a basic overview of what commodities do, how they work, um, you know, maybe a, a few ideas to think about before you suddenly decide to become a commodity, a heavy commodity investor. So the next thing I want to look at is, is um, okay, first, uh, you know, how do you actually invest in commodities? What are the different ways you can invest in commodities? And then also, should you be buying the underlying uh, mineral or good, or should you be buying the producer and, and facing all of those risks that I've just uh, I've just mentioned? Um, so if we look at uh, yeah, so if we look at the uh, how to invest in commodities, uh, okay, like what are the the basic areas? I'd say there's four that I've identified. So if if the, if the commodity that you're talking about is very dense, so very small and it's it, it's quite quite dense and it's got a high value to weight ratio, if you want to put it that way, and it's not dangerous, then you can invest in the physical. So buying something like a gold coin, very very easy. Investing in physical gold, it makes perfect sense because you can literally go on with your stock on screen with your stockbroker, and you can put the ticker as KR, and you can go and pull up a Kruger Rand, and you can go and hit the uh, you can go lift the offer on a Kruger Rand, and the next thing on a Tuesday, your Kruger Rand will arrive, and you can go collect it and put it in your pocket or put it in the safe. It's very easy for you to store that uh, that commodity if you want to if you want to call gold a commodity. It is, I suppose, technically a commodity because it's mined. People call it a currency as well, but um, yeah, that's that's very simple. It's very different. Even if you translate to that to something like silver, silver's trading. Uh, you know, I think it's at uh, twenty-one dollars an ounce at the moment. It's uh, you're gonna, you know, if you want to make a meaningful investment in silver, you know, you might be talking about having to get a warehouse to house all that silver. It's very different when when you're you're trading at uh, just under two thousand dollars an ounce or, or twenty-one dollars an ounce. You start getting proper physical bulk in, in the commodity that you're buying. The same with something like iron ore. To go and physically buy iron ore as a retail investor. I mean, you're going to have to have huge yards to pile up your iron ore or your coal. It's not practical to invest in, in, in physical in that situation. Uh, the same with something like uranium. Uh, you know, you, you, you can't invest in uranium. You can't just go and buy a little bit of yellow cake and stick it in your fridge. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. You're obviously, you're not going to actually have access to those physical markets. Um, so you've got to kind of also look at the commodity that you're trying to target and see whether holding the physical is actually something that can be relevant to you. Um, there's a wonderful article on Bloomberg years ago about, uh, it was one of the journalists tried to buy and invest in a physical barrel of oil. And these things are like a barrel of oil is actually highly toxic. And she ended up putting it in a bath and like they, they had to have hazmat suits. It was like a total disaster. It's a wonderful article from I think it was about 2011. Um, but yeah, physical only works in very, very specific situations. How do we solve the problem of, of physical? Uh, there, that's where ETFs and ETNs come in. So what is an ETF and an ETN? An exchange traded fund or an exchange traded note? Uh, and this is basically paper. So it's paper that is issued, uh, proxy paper, um, and you can avoid a lot of the physical problems with it. So one of the first uh, ETFs, which is an exchange traded fund that was uh, issued in South Africa was the New Gold ETF, uh, which gave you basically the promise of uh, one hundredth of an ounce of gold um, that used to sit in the Rand refinery. I think it still sits in the Rand refinery, and you have a claim on that underlying gold. 
Now, the difference between an ETF and an ETN is an ETF, you have claim on that physical underlying, so the absolute new gold ETF almost became what the dollar was when there was still the gold standard. It was a little piece of paper or a little digital contract or a digital note uh, like they are today that said you actually own a little piece of gold sitting in a, in a refinery. And for that, you would pay a managed fee. Um, I think their management fee at that stage was about 1% when they first started out. It has come down quite a bit since then. Um, but essentially that management fee covered the, you know, the, the, the physical storage of your gold and it covered basically the setup of the ETF, et cetera. And you know, it, it ended up working out a lot better for people than holding physical crude grants because they didn't have the risk of you know, having them stolen. They didn't have to pay insurance or they didn't have to pay for a safety deposit box and they didn't run that kind of risk. So what's the difference between an ETF and an ETN? An ETN is an exchange traded note. An exchange traded note is basically, it's a, it's a promise uh, from a banking institution saying that we will track the, the price of this underlying. But you don't actually have a claim on that physical underlying the same way as the, the ETF. Um, so you basically have to be happy with that bank's credit risk. So if you're buying a Standard Bank linking, Linker or a Standard Bank uh, ETN, you've got to be comfortable that Standard Bank uh, is going to be okay and that they're promising to pay you, let's say, the silver price. Now that's, that's uh, an ETN. Um, the other way to invest in, in commodities is to actually go and buy the producer, to buy the business, the miner or the farmer. So you can, you know, this is I'm talking about uh, going and buying something like uh, Glencore, Anglo-American or Tungela resources. Uh, here you face all the operational challenges of the business, but you also benefit uh, uh, in, in other ways. And that's one, you have an experienced management team that is trying to produce at the, the right pace. They're trying to make sure that uh, you know, their, their cost of production is below the cost of their ultimate commodity uh, and that they're going to generate profits and those profits are gonna be paid over to you as a shareholder. Now, I'll talk about the difference between this in a second. Um, you know, farming the same, you know, you can go and look at uh, kind of direct linked, uh, you know, uh, agri, agri businesses. Uh, but the other way to do it is the supplier. And it's the idea of you don't want to go and buy, uh, let's say, a gold miner. You might want to go and buy someone who sells shovels to gold miners, you know, and that's, and it's, it's trying to pick up some of the downstream benefits. So you can buy suppliers into the, the primary sector. And often if you get a big uh, uh, spike up in commodity prices, those those kind of direct suppliers will benefit. So you think fertilizer providers, um, you know, uh, for, for farming specifically, you're talking like fertilizer, uh, equipment, uh, mining is like big yellow machines, something like Barlow World would, would do well. Um, and that's, that's a different way to capture a commodity price. And then finally, uh, the trader. So the trader can also go in there. And like I said, like if you're very savvy, and I mean, if you are a farmer and you kind of have a very good idea of what's happening in the weather and you've got your crop photos and you kind of know what's happening with El Nino and El Nino, um, and you've got a good sense of where this underlying market has been because you know, farming is in your blood and you've been farming wheat for the last 150 years and your family has had this farm for generations and you, you're very, very close to the, the underlying commodity, um, then you can probably have a, a much more reasonable chance of trading it. Um, as a novice investor, just deciding that you're going to go and do some technicals on wheat, you're probably going to, you're probably not going to end, it's probably not going to end, end well for you. Um, but you can also pay professionals to do this for you. And it's one of the ideas I'll chat about a bit later in the presentation. But um, you can look at like something like a commodity arbitrage hedge fund, which are professional traders that have all that expertise. And you can just leverage off their expertise uh, to, to benefit from, from mispricings in commodity markets. Now, a question that I get asked kind of over and over again, it happens on the, the business channels regularly. It, it's just something that always comes out whenever there's a big commodity price move. They say, would you buy the underlying or would you buy the business? Should you be buying the miner or should you be buying gold? Should you be buying Kumbo or should you be buying iron ore? Um, so the, the way that I, I've kind of started to think about it these days is, is that there's a big difference in, in how the value of a, a miner and the commodity is generated. The value of any commodity is generated purely through scarcity. That, that is where the, 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 the supply demand dynamic in, in that underlying market, you know, if there's an oversupply, um, and there isn't the demand to match it, the prices will fall. Um, another way, if there's, there's a high demand and not enough supply, uh, the prices will rise. And, and that is what's generating the, the returns, if you want to put it in, in commodity markets. Now that's very different from a formal uh, investment instrument or, or, or something like an equity or a bond, which is essentially part of the capital structure of, of a business or a, a commodity producer. Uh, because what happens when you buy a share? What does a share mean versus buying a lump of gold? What does a share in a gold miner give you? A share in a gold miner gives you a call on the profit of that gold miner. It's saying that when that gold miner makes profit, you, you are due a portion of those earnings 
um, that can be paid out as dividends or it could be paid out you know, via share buybacks and, and to, to help the, the stock price appreciate. You might be taking it as capital appreciation, but essentially you have a claim on those underlying earnings. Now, what do you get for that uh, when you buy a stock? You get a, like I said, you get a management team that is um, probably top engineers and, and top uh, commodity miners. You're adding value to an ore body because there's this whole management team that is mining that ore, ore body and, uh, and you get to benefit from all of that as a shareholder. The same as if you're a bondholder of a mining company, what have you done? You've said, I've looked at the, the risk that this business is going to go under, and I've said, I will lend them you know, X amount of money, but in return for that, they're going to give me my, my capital back, plus they're going to give me my coupon. So that you're taking your money, and they are promising to pay you more than your money back. Now, with that, over a long period of time, both of those kind of stocks and bonds, uh, which are the more traditional, which are non, not alternative assets, uh, as a commodity would be, uh, they will compound over time because you know you'll invest and you'll get your coupon and the coupon you can reinvest and and you'll be able to compound that return whereas holding a commodity long term you're only really benefiting from the inflation you're benefiting from the devaluation of a currency that is propping up the, the price of that that commodity in the long term and otherwise it's just supply demand uh, dynamics kind of shifting the the, the relative scarcity of your underlying commodities so if it actually came to me, like if I was a long-term investor and I was looking at, you know, for the long-term saying, I want to uh, get involved in commodities and I want to be there for a long time, I would say you definitely go with a business rather than, than just rely on scarcity. Uh, because scarcity changes uh, very, very quickly. Um, if you're a trader, of course, you're trying to see that price action and you're trying to benefit from it. So that's kind of my, my view. At the moment, I'm, I'm kind of tending to lean towards uh, like a more formal investment vehicle. But it really depends on what you're trying to achieve. If you're taking a six-month view, then you probably wouldn't buy, buy the miner the, 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 or, or the, the farmer. Um, the beauty of, of kind of buying the, the, the business as well is that if your, your call is correct, so let's say that uh, a gold miner has a, an all-in sustaining cost of $1,100 an ounce, and suddenly your gold price is sitting at $1,800 an ounce, um, you've got this, like it's basically an accounting that's called operating leverage, they have these fixed costs, they've sunk their shafts, they've got their labor and their labor is paid. And they might've had to do a couple of above inflation increases, but their labor is working on the mine. Uh, all their big yellow machines are there. They've got a cost of capital, they've got a business, right? And their costs are, are coming out at, at $1,100. Um, if the gold price suddenly just starts to run, it doesn't add anything to their cost base. Their, their product is just a, a, lot, a lot more in demand. And what happens is all of that additional revenue that's generated as the price appreciates just drops straight to the bottom line. So often what you, you end up getting in the commodity miners, especially in a, in a bull run for commodity markets, is you get these huge chunky dividends because the, the, either the guys can't sink shafts fast enough and they can't, I mean, building a mine, for example, is a long-term uh, project. Farmers can't suddenly double the size of their farms and, uh, and, and suddenly produce three times as much uh, crops as they used to be able to. So supply kind of stays there and, and you just get these kind of like big bumper windfall profits. So my, my preference is, is at the moment to, to, to go into the, the underlying business uh, rather than the thing, but you know, qualified as it, it really depends on what you're trying to achieve. If you're, you're speculating in the short term, then it's a lot cheaper and probably a lot, uh, you, you could probably maybe do a lot better on underlying contracts. So what, what is um, one of the popular ways to invest in commodities? Like if you're looking at uh, the, the, the direct commodities. So exchange traded funds are the 88 uh, listed ETFs on our exchange as is listed on the JSE website at the moment. Um, eight of those are commodity-based ETFs. And you can see it's, it's very much uh, focused on the platinum, palladium, rhodium, uh, gold. Half of, uh, you know, almost half, well, exactly, exactly half of them are done by, by one invest. Um, and of course, you've got uh, GLB, which is the Absa New Gold ETF that I was talking about, uh, which gives you access to gold, but very, very limited in terms of uh, you know what you can actually do. But any of these ETFs will give you a physical claim on those underlying on those underlying instruments. When it comes to looking at something like ETF Row, which is rhodium, just remember that the rhodium market is not nearly as uh, liquid. So the physical rhodium market is nowhere near as liquid as something like the gold market. Uh, you know, gold. You know, you've got a, a, an international gold price, rhodium. Uh, that price is actually set in the physical market. So I would say go and look at the, the pricing and how these ETFs work. But that's pretty much what's available to you on, on the local exchange. Um, of course, you've got a whole lot of uh, ETNs as well. So you, you can go and express a view on things like uh, oil and copper. 
um, through some exchange traded notes as well. Now that's that's kind of your your JSE listed options. Of course, you can also go and look at uh, kind of the agri markets where you can go and trade uh, your or like uh, Safix, for example. You can go and trade futures on on underlying uh, agri prices as well. And of course, once when it comes to actual listed uh, companies on our exchange. Uh, the list is long. We we are very much a commodity-based exchange. So compared to someone who's uh, you know sitting sitting in other countries, uh, you know if you you're living in Italy and you're looking at uh, or you're sitting in Germany looking at Deutsche Börse, um, South African investors have in, are absolutely spoiled for choice when it comes to mining companies, which is I suppose my preferred way of getting involved in in the market. I mean you've got the you know the big diversifiers, you've got the likes of Anglo and, and BHP Group, you've got uh, you know African Rainbow Minerals, you've got a commodity trading, well, well at least a, a, it's a it's a big diversified but also a commodity trading firm like Glencore. Uh, you've got two amazing coal producers uh, in Exara and Tungela. Tungela obviously spun out of um, of Anglo American uh, as they try and get their ESG profile right. Gold miners, you've got Anglo Gold, DRD Gold, Goldfields Harmony, I mean, Panaf, uh, you know, Platinum, uh, you know, you've got uh, Amplats, Implats, Northern, RB Plats. I mean, the amount of commodity companies listed on our exchanges is absolutely massive. Um, if you're looking at softs, uh, we've got things like Carp Agri, you've got, uh, you know, some, some fertilizer companies, you've got things like Zieda as well. So there are a lot of options for investors looking to take advantage of either soft commodities or or hard commodities in, in the South African exchange. That said, if you do look a little bit wider uh, and you start looking at uh, kind of international investment as well, and you're not and you're prepared to use your offshore allowances, uh, the world really opens up. What, what a retail investor can do these days in the commodity markets is, is, is nothing short of spectacular. So I've just put uh, a couple of the contracts up and this is by no means exhaustive um, on our offshore platform that we give to, to retail clients. I mean, you can trade <laughs> literally uh, like just just putting it up here, I'll just list them. So, so I've just put the kind of the big commodity miners uh, and and kind of soft access up to, uh, at the top. So things like Vale, um, uh, B, uh, BP, so like BP, Royal Dutch Shell, uh, Rio Tinto, Exxon Mobil, all of these you know listed in you know across uh, you know everywhere from Europe to the US to um, to uh, to London, uh, you can get access to that. You can get access to things like Nutrion and DuPont and Bayer. If you're looking at inputs into into the the agri sector, things like Deere and Co. Uh, yeah, you're looking at tractors. Then of course you can go and trade, you know, physical gold, physical silver. Um, you can trade platinum. Uh, you can trade, you know, I've put the the Sprott uranium miners ETF in there. You can really get uh, access directly to uranium miners. You can trade corn, sugar, wheat. Orange juice, copper, it's kind of like what you want. And as I said, you can trade a whole lot of different types of oil, uh, depending on what your view is. Everything from Brent crude oil to West Texas to Light Sweet. There is a lot of options out there for, for, um, for, for retail investors. So, so you're not limited, is what I'm saying. You're certainly not limited in, in how you can express a view. Um, but where are commodity markets today? And I think that's, that's kind of key now, because like, what I've got to try and answer for you tonight is, where do you actually deploy capital if you're looking to take advantage of commodity markets and, and, and what is the situation on the ground? So let's let's look at that for a second. Okay, so first of all, like there's no question. I mean, anyone that's been in financial markets recently will know that like it's it's scary out there. It is very, it's I mean, you know, this is the fear the CNN fear and greed index, and I'm just gonna paint a quick backdrop of where we're at. Uh, the market right now is is in in trouble. Um, you know. People are very, very nervous. We've had big drawdowns. I mean, the S&P 500 is in a bear market. Uh, South Africa has fared a lot better because of its high commodity exposure. So we're only down around 10% uh, at the moment. Um, but I mean, this is all coming because there's a lot of fear at the moment that uh, that, that we are going to go into recession. Um, you know, OPEC has announced uh, you know, price uh, like uh, output increases. That's a little bit uh, suspect as well because you know, OPEC announced uh, you know, big, big output increases, but then they kind of like changed the way that their quota system worked and said, oh, Libya, you can, you can produce a lot more. Russia, you, you're fine. You can produce as much as you want. And, and, and these were countries that actually couldn't produce the, their quotas anyway. So there was kind of a, a little bit of a, a misnomer in the oil markets. And, and now what's happened is obviously with the, the Fed kind of hiking interest rates, which I'm going to look at in the next slide, um, 
we've had, uh, you know, we, we're looking at the potential of a hard landing. We're looking at the potential of demand actually sapping out of the economy, out of, out of global economies. So we've seen the oil price coming down in the last couple of days because of that. People are really afraid that we're going to go into a very recessionary uh, conditions. Even Elon Musk has the super bad feeling about the economy at the moment. In an economy that is not growing, commodity prices will fall. So just we need to put that in, in, uh, in perspective. Uh, headlines from today in the Financial Times, iron ore price surrenders gains for the year as Chinese demand cools. So we're, we're getting the sense that economy, like the, the, the picture out there is very, very tough. Um, crude oil buckles as recession angst rattles commodity investors. So this big run up that we've seen in commodities is starting to unwind a little bit as people get really concerned about, uh, about the growth picture. Um, so just looking at, uh, I'm just going to look at the U.S. economy very, very quickly. Um, just to give you a sense of kind of where we're at uh, in, in the cycle, and I've got a nice commodity clock for you at the end where we're going to kind of try and put where we are, where, what time we're at. Um, but what, what's happened in the U.S. inflation, we, we've gone into a very inflationary period over the last, let's say, uh, you know, let's say, call it the last year. Um, two prints ago when we got that 8.3 percent print, I think everyone just breathed a sigh of relief and, and there was this hope in markets that that maybe things are getting better, maybe inflation is going to, to moderate, and maybe we're not going to have this hard landing, and maybe the Fed isn't going to have to increase interest rates quite as aggressively. And markets started to rally. We had equity markets starting to rise again, and I think commodity markets subsided a little bit. And then we got last month's print, and it was just like, oops, this isn't over yet. We're pretty much getting the worst, worst US inflation figures that we've had ever. Um, so inflation is in the system big time. That should technically be good for commodity markets because remember commodities do act as an inflation hedge. Now the problem is that we've already seen a response and, and just remember this when we're talking about the commodity clock in, in the next couple of slides. The Fed is responding very, very aggressively. Look at, look at the, you know, how the Fed, you know, very gradually hiked rates, uh, you know, from 2016 onwards. Um, you know, your you guys might even go further back and remember the taper tantrum before that. It was like the Fed was, you know, very slowly, very gently easing the market into the idea of higher interest rates. Uh, what's happened now is uh, the Fed is almost panicking. <laughs> I mean, in our research meeting this morning, we do research every, every Thursday. I mean, we're also looking at what's going on in the Bank of Japan fascinating things happening in, in, in the Japanese bond markets at the moment. But we have the Fed really just putting pedal to the metal here. And, um, and, and you, can see the, you can see how fast with that 75 basis points of the 0.75% hike, you can see how fast interest rates are going up in, in the US at the moment. How does the Fed control inflation with interest rates? They stall the economy. That is what they're trying to do. It's, stalling the economy is not a byproduct of, of increasing interest rates. It's the point of increasing interest rates. They're trying to stop the economy uh, from growing. That, that is what they're trying to do. They're saying the economy is too hot and it's starting to result in inflation. When the Fed does that, they kill demand. When demand get killed, gets killed, commodity prices fall. So just bear that in mind. That's the situation that we're sitting in from an economic point of view. Unemployment 3.6, 3.6, 3.6. For a long time, people considered uh, below 4% impossible. They, they didn't see below 4%. You know, in any economy, there's what's called the frictional rate of inflation. And frictional inflation, that's the kind of their level of, in, un, un, sorry, inflation, I'm saying inflation, unemployment, frictional unemployment. Um, that's the level of un unemployment in an economy that is supposed to be there. It's people that have resigned and are naturally looking for other jobs because they're changing careers, essentially. Um, people didn't believe that you could get unemployment below 3.6%. They considered that below frictional. Now, what's happened is that's just another sign that the, the labor market in the U.S. is very, very hot, that the Fed is going to kill. They, they are going to have to kill, um, kill growth. It's, they're going to basically try and create a recession in the U.S. Now, remember, from a stock market point of view, that means that everything goes down. Now, fortunately, stock markets are forward looking. So what's happened here is you can see this is a picture. This is a year to date heat map of uh, the S&P 500. Uh, there's a year to date kind of heat map of the whole world. Um, you can see where the patches of, of the bright spots have been. Um, part of it has been the oil and gas market. Part of it has been the energy markets, things like ExxonMobil uh, up 43% uh, year to date. So that's the oil and gas companies really running. They are already ending this high inflation. Um, commodity prices have, have already run. You've got a little bit of like a, a safe haven in the, uh, in the healthcare sector. Um, you can see that here yeah, with things like, okay, so Royal Dutch Shell up uh, 17%, AstraZeneca up 10%. That's really been the only kind of hiding place. Like locally, um, uh, you've got uh, uh, Sassel, they, they're using the US ticker there that's actually sold on our market. 
Uh, but you can kind of see this is a petroleum company as well. So it's really been oil and gas. It's been the only green spots in, in, in equity markets uh, recently. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think just be careful when you consider that markets and equity markets specifically are very forward looking. So while a recession is probably going to happen, it's our view that we are going to get a recession in the US, um, the stock market has in a way already reacted. And, and the recession that's coming is what the stock market is currently predicting. So let's look at the, now some of the commodity price moves over time as well. And I've got kind of a couple of different charts that I'm going to run through quickly with you. I want to leave some time for questions as well. But uh, Refinitiv, this is basically the Bloomberg Commodity Index and the Refinitiv Commodity Index. You can see what's happened since 2020 lows. Uh, commodities have absolutely gone berserk. Now, the, the green is the S&P 500. You can see that stock markets have started coming down this year as commodity prices keep running. But commodity prices have been running hard. I just want to take you out a little bit further. Now, this goes back to the idea of should you be investing in the physical commodity or should you be investing in, in, in a, a stock or, or should you be investing in uh, the miner or, or, or just the market in general and maybe avoiding commodities? This is the return of the S&P 500 in green versus, uh, again, the Bloomberg Commodity Index and the Refinitiv Core Commodity Index in orange. Um, you can see that even after this big run up, so that kind of period there is the period that I showed on the previous slide. Uh, so let me show you, it's uh, that period there, over there. Um, that that period is still not taking us up to kind of the, the high levels of 2008. So, you know, you add inflation into the mix now as well. Um, there is the potential for this to go a lot higher. So is, is it time to turf commodities totally and get out? You know, just looking at historic price action, there could be a lot more run. There's certainly momentum behind this commodity run up. Long term though, equities are going to outperform a direct investment in commodities. Just, you know, just keep, keep that in the back of your mind. And that's what I wanted to show you on that slide. What's happening in the oil markets? I've already talked a little bit about oil markets. So this is just a year to date chart. You can see what's happening with oil at the moment. So these are some, some different types of oil and, and kind of almost energy market stuff. LCOC1, um, which is the, the green one, uh, is up, okay, when I pulled this chart, this chart was pulled a, a week or two ago, um, up about 100%. So, so, I mean, you've almost had a doubling in, in the Brent crude oil price. Now, is this the top? If you look at uh, kind of uh, a lot of sell side research, you look, you listen to someone like Goldman Sachs, uh, you know, a lot of the big banks, you know, have said once you adjust for inflation, I mean, if anyone remembers the $144 barrel oil, I think that's the time that uh, SAA decided that they had to hedge oil as well. They said, we can't afford to go any higher. And that was pretty much the, the peak of where the oil markets were. If you then adjust this for inflation, you know, we're probably sitting at about $180, $190 a barrel to get back to if, we, if we're in that situation again. The problem is, like my view is that the Fed has already started trying to, to kind of curtail the, the growth. And, and, and I think that it's going to be real demand concerns in, in the market. It's one of the reasons that we saw oil pulling back from $120 a barrel this week. Um, also, you've got to understand that, you know, Economies are very, very efficient, and they, they, they were, they were well, how can I say, oil companies or companies or you know, economies, people are, are very innovative in reacting to supply shocks. So why has oil gone berserk? Okay, part of oil, I mean, we've had inflation, and part of the reason that oil has gone berserk is because we've had COVID and supply shocks, and there honestly has just been an underinvestment in the sector. When we bought ExxonMobil years ago, when oil was trading negative, um, and we were adding things like ExxonMobil to portfolios. Uh, you know, we, we were listening to the executive at that stage and looking at the, the energy reports and, and it was, people were saying like, we still use oil. There's no physical way that the, the world is going to wean itself off oil. There is, there's going to be a supply shortage. And it was just because we had green energy coming in and ever, no one wanted a dirty oil and gas player and the performance had been terrible because uh, OPEC had been, uh, you know, almost flooding the market. I mean, I don't know if you remember when Russia and Saudi Arabia got into a bit of a spat and they just decided they were going to flood the market of oil at that stage. Uh, it was kind of as coronavirus uh, was really picking up, demand disappeared and supply went berserk and that's when oil traded negative. That was a great time to be buying oil. Should you be buying oil now? You know, yes, Ukraine has had a big effect on, on the, the energy markets, but if you look at uh, import numbers from, from China, uh, the May import numbers, you can see that uh, Russia has actually displaced Saudi Arabia as the, the, the biggest supplier of oil to China. Uh, there was like a 55% spike in oil bought uh, from uh, Russia, uh, Chinese, China buying oil from Russia. Um, so what you're seeing is you, you are seeing the markets adapt. You know, for example, uh, Russia is now selling wheat to Bangladesh. So while you have European sanctions on Russian oil, Russian oil is not suddenly just not being sold. And whereas 
you know, let's say Germany might have bought Russian oil in, in the past, they might buy it from Saudi Arabia, but, but China is just, you know, the, the patterns of trade are just changing. Um, and I get the sense that, you know, the idea of us going to $200 a barrel, I, I don't think that that's happening. I think we are at the, the upper side, uh, just, just my view. Again, super efficient markets, you know, a lot of uh, market participants. I'm just a portfolio manager, I'm not an oil analyst, so this is kind of my, my sense of, uh, of where oil is and how I would be deploying uh, capital. Um, Looking at this, so this is just a, a chart of the power complex. Uh, specifically, you can see that uh, the big spike uh, up and down, uh, that's uh, NGL NMC1, uh, which is um, ICE, okay, so it's uh, European Con uh, Intercontinental Exchange. So that's U UK natural gas. And you can just see, I mean, if you've read any headlines recently, you'll know what's happening in the energy markets in Europe. Uh, I mean, prices up significantly. Again, what is this going to do? This is taking money out of consumers' profit, uh, pockets. It's going to dampen demand. Um, and, you know, there's always, there's the saying that inflation is inflation's best uh, cure as well. So, you know, we are going to go through a period of slower markets. Now, for me, is this priced into equity markets? I think equity markets are starting to price it in. I don't think it's yet priced into commodity markets. I think prices could start to fall in commodity markets. So I just want to look at the soft market for a second. So these are a whole lot of different soft um, soft uh, contracts. KCC2 is ICE US coffee futures. It's not ICE coffee futures. You're not drinking like cold coffee. Uh, again, intercontinental exchange uh, coffee futures. Um, all of these uh, just giving you kind of a sense of, of, of what is happening with uh, the price of softs. And you can see the price is up heavily. Um, you know, we, we are seeing a big run up. Food prices are going to inflate. Food prices are going to be an issue. I mean, we, we're talking about massive, massive run, runs up in, in these commodity prices. And, and yes, markets can adjust to, 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 a, to an extent. Um, but, you know, like where I think oil, oil and gas and energy markets might be topping out a little bit. Um, you know, like in our research meeting this morning, our guys were very bullish on coal, not so much on oil. So they prefer coal to oil, for example. Um, there's no question that we are facing much, much higher soft commodity prices, which is going to fuel inflation. Um, but would you go in and go and buy direct contracts? I personally probably wouldn't, uh, unless you're a trader, not certainly not as a long-term investment. Um, here are some wheat, uh, corn, uh, milling wheat, and a whole lot of different grains and oil seeds. Uh, you can see also, I mean, you're talking up, up, you know, above 100%, between 100 and 200% for the year. I mean, commodity prices are a lot higher. Soft commodity prices are a lot higher than they they have been previously. I've given you a nice long-term chart going back to kind of like 2002, and I just want to show you like the the, <laughs> the kind of increases that we've seen. I mean, we're talking about significantly higher than we were kind of 2008, 2011. This is this is this is this is a these are big moves, very very big moves. So now I've got to decide for you guys: is it too late to, to get involved? Which was the the mandate that Simon gave me. Um, so I've kind of put this, put this up, okay, one of the most traded commodities. Now remember, the, the reason I've got that up, those are according to the Futures Industry Association, the most traded commodities uh, in the world. Um, but just, just, just take it that every commodity is unique. So, so the commodities that we're probably constructive on are things like coal, things like lithium. Uh, platinum, we think is gonna be sideways, uh, prob probably down. We don't see, see huge, a huge run up in platinum. Oil, like I said, oil, very difficult to read in all of this. I mean, you've got to take with a pinch of salt, uh, you know, because they are such efficient markets. But um, yeah, I'd say oil demand, I think I, I, I wouldn't be hoping for another 100% up if, you, if you're buying oil at this stage. So where are we in what I call the commodity clock at the moment? Now, I like our view is we're, we're probably between half past one and half past two, not quite at three o'clock yet, but we're getting towards three o'clock where we're gonna start to see fall in commodity prices. We've seen overseas, okay, locally we have our own challenges around real estate, but if you look at real estate values overseas, they have been flying. Um, interest rates, rising interest rates. There's no question that the interest rate cycle has started. We are starting to see rising interest rates. Have we seen falling share prices? Yes, stock markets are down. Have commodity prices started to sort of fall? I get the sense that com commodity prices are now starting to fall. We're not quite at recession, but I mean, again, if I go uh, quickly back to that uh, US slide, remember a recession is two quarters of negative growth. We've had one quarter of negative growth in the US already. So we're, we're getting quite close to, to, to a recession. That moves us into recession, money is a lot tighter, economies contract, uh, real estate values start to fall, uh, which I think is next. 
um, you know, you, you've got commodity, this is the dark night before the recovery recovery starts. Um, and I think commodity prices probably have some downside in general. Um, so I would be concerned. I would be concerned. I think you've got falling share prices. I think we're in for another probably rough six, seven, eight, nine months. Um, and I don't know if we already have hit bottoms, or, or, but I think in the next six months, we'll see bottoms in the share market and the opportunity is not going to be so much in the, in the commodity price itself, but it's going to be in the share market, um, potentially buying into uh, things that benefit from, from, from higher commodity prices. But, uh, but yeah, I still think that those kind of like very, very solid equities are going to do better for you in the shorter term. Uh, but then the time will come where, where once commodity prices have uh, fallen, that you start moving towards um, towards rising commodity prices again. But I, I get the sense that we're, we're getting towards the top of the cycle at the moment, and, and even we might even just be over the top of the cycle. So just be be cautious. Um, so now I'm going to have to give you some some stock picks because I think that's always tradition with the uh, JSE Power Hours. Um, so. All these things. I just want to put our research committee up here as well. Um, you know, I've drawn two of these from from Anthony Clark, who's uh, you know we're very fortunate to get some some small cap input for for him. So two of my stock picks are actually Anthony stock picks. Um, of course, if if you haven't signed up to our stuff, I mean, please go sign up to our weekly wrap. It's free for all. You don't have to be a client. And obviously, if you are looking at trading actively, if you want to go and trade, you know, gold and silver and and you know the kind of the shorter term price movements, uh, we do we have a little service called Trader Connect, which kind of sends out little recommendations to to things. And you will have to become a client, unfortunately, to get that. But the free fall, if you don't want to, you're not ready to be a client, at least come and listen to us once a week. Uh, Bob gives his view of uh, what's going on in the world, a little 10 minute video. So, so go sign up to that. But I'm going to kind of uh, share some of Anthony's picks with you. So these are commodity based. Now, I'm, I'm sticking mainly to the softs, not the hards, because I think some of the miners have already run hard enough. Um, and the one that, that we like at the moment uh, is, is Omnia. Uh, Omnia is, of course, a uh, you know it's a you know but but it's it's it, it's kind of inputs into the agricultural sector as well as the uh, the mining industry. Uh, if you actually look at the uh, revenue splits for them on on 2021, uh, about it's just under half of the the the. Um, uh, their revenue is generated from agriculture, about 30% is generated from mining. So a, a nice input into, into the commodity markets. Um, you know, the, the rest is kind of made up with uh, the chemicals business. But you know, if you look at what's happened to, 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 to wheat prices, corn prices, all those grain prices, with those uh, you know, kind of shooting up as they, as they have shot up, um, farmers will demand, they are going to try and plant. The, the, the kind of prices they're willing to pay for things like fertilizer is, is going up dramatically. Um, the fact is that yes, there has been uh, some uh, adapting in, in in the Russian and Ukrainian situation. But you know, the idea—it was a question that was asked to me by a client today. You know, what 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 happens if the Ukraine war ends today? What will happen? Uh, and I kind of my kind of view is like, the markets will probably pop seven percent. But a lot of this has already been kind of worked into into the market. Um, but yeah, look at looking at it. I mean. There is there's certainly still a tailwind in this, and uh, you know, looking at Omnia, I mean Omnia has been been a fantastic provider, and again you've got a, a, like a really top notch top notch management uh, team in there, um, and currently the target price, I mean the stock, I checked the stock now, stock is trading, you know, it was trading at around 72 uh, at close today. Um, Anthony's target on this is 100 100 rand a share. He says you know a little bit of volatility after the results, um, but uh, kind of he's quite comfortable to hold until 100 100 rand a share. Uh, the, the second one is obviously Carp Agri. So Carp Agri, uh, you know, is uh, if you're not sure with Carp Agri, it's uh, kind of a, a company that you know it has a lot of inputs into the, the farming sector. Uh, it does everything from kind of like mechanization and all the. I mean, they've got like a fuel business in there. Um, yeah, and uh, it's also it's trading kind of 40 rand a share now. This is really Anthony says one of the only companies that he would never sell in his portfolio. He's, he's got it in his, his long-term his long term retirement portfolio, if you want to put it that way. Um, he thinks it's uh, like incredible. I mean, he's been recommending it from 23 Rand, uh, I think, and it's kind of achieved his price targets. I think that the reason the stock's been under a little bit of pressure recently, it was unbundled from, from zero. So a lot of people received uh, Carp Agri shares in their portfolio. They kind of probably were selling out, selling out of it um, because they didn't understand what it was. Uh, and there was a bit of an overhang on the stock, but uh, certainly a good quality company that will definitely benefit if uh, if uh, soft commodity prices are, are remain high for the next uh, 6, 12, 18 months. Uh, I think you can expect good results out of them. 
And then, okay, so those are my kind of two stock picks that we'll come back in a year's time and you guys will be like, wow, Gary, that was, those were terrible stock picks. Well, that would be great. And Omni would be at a 150 rand a share. And I'll say, yeah, there you go. Thank you for playing the guy. Um, but yeah, I thought I'll give you one, one kind of alternative idea as well uh, that comes off our wealth desk, uh, which isn't actually a stock pick at all. Uh, so this is actually fun. So this is like, if you want to try and take, instead of, uh, instead of trying to understand commodity markets and try and you know, scalp the, the you know, 2% here and 3% here because you know, you're, you're, you're actively trading an underlying commodity price. Um, this fund, what this fund does, it is a, an offshore fund, um, but they're an absolute uh, return commodity hedge fund. Um, and they're basically trying to ex extract cyclical and structural anomalies from the agricultural commodity market. So these guys are traders. They are hardcore traders. Um, they, I think there's about 6 billion Rand in the fund at the moment. Um, it is quite difficult to get a, a custody and to get involved, but if you are interested, just drop us a line. Uh, but they've been around since kind of mid 2010 uh, and, and the performance stats are up there for you. I mean, they've done exceptionally well. Um, you know, for, they, they're a hedge fund though, so just bear in mind that uh, it is for kind of qualified investors. Uh, you know, minimum amount is gonna be a thousand, uh, at least a hundred thousand dollars to get in. Redemption is 30 days, there's not huge liquidity on it. Their fees are high, they hedge fund. They take 2% and 20% out performance, but all of those returns are after cost. I mean, you can see with the chaos that we saw in commodity markets in 2020, I mean, they managed to make a 62% return that year. And that's kind of the, the, the MSCI World Index versus what their returns have been over the last 10 years. Uh, it does have an eyes on it's a formally registered fund. Like I said, it's got about 6 billion Rand in it, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and they've had a very, very solid uh, performance. So if you're interested in something like that, uh, where you giving it to a manager to run, uh, that's definitely something that I think is worth having a look at. Um, if you are interested in getting started with, not necessarily on the Polistar Fund, but if you willing to, you would like to get involved in, uh, I suppose, trading and stockbroking and, and the JSE and markets, uh, really simple to open an account with us. Come join the number one securities broker in South Africa. Uh, go to randswiss.com, open an account, send us uh, basic FICA documents, uh, ID, proof of residential address, uh, proof of bank account. Fund your account, get your welcome pack, and away you go. And that's it. I think I've got three minutes to spare for questions. Sorry, Sam. Hey, Gary, that was uh, perfect. I've got my camera. Uh, you can barely, I'm in candlelight here. And it's the best I can do uh, is a couple of candles. One day I must tell you folks my story of trading softs on Suffix. Um, first, there was the limit up, then there was the half day, and it ended with me being delivered a contract. Let's be clear, a contract is 100 tons of maize. Uh, it, was a, it was a horror story of note. A bunch of questions are coming through, many being answered. A quick last one, because I'm cognizant of time. Of the PGM miners in South Africa, have you got a preference? We've got uh, Sabania, there's Northern, of course, as well. Uh, there's uh, Implats, there's Anglo Platinum. Do you have a, pre a preference uh, amongst that group? Um, I, we do. <laughs> we do. So we, we, we do we do we do run a local fund. Uh, well, it's a local local managed portfolio, discretionary portfolio for for clients. And uh, we we have had uh, so we have Amplats in there currently, and we have Sabania uh, at the moment. Sabania has obviously gone through a, a little bit of a challenging time with a very long strike, and mm -hmm. uh, obviously they have they have some issues overseas as well. So uh, it, it, it's between between Sabania and Amplats. If I had to pick one, uh, you know. In Platts, London, Northern, I, I don't think they're quite at the same grade. So Banya, I think I, I, I do believe is a better management team, um, but but Amplats is the juggernaut in the, in, in the space. Yeah, they absolutely is, 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 is the juggernaut. Uh, question came through uh, around oil, and I think, uh, Gary, to a degree, you've, you've kind of answered it. If someone's saying, you know, I, I bought uh, uh, Cecil in 2020, which, I mean, I mean, somewhere, what, 40, 50, I mean, maybe 80 Rand or something like that. Um, you know, worth taking some profits on it. I mean, my sense from what you're saying here is, if not exiting the position, some profits up around the 400 is probably not a bad idea because you're sitting on a heck of a profit over, what, two years? Yeah. 100%. Just yeah, just remember that. And like I said, like I wish I wish I could tell where underlying commodity prices yeah. are going because uh, I, I wouldn't be doing presentations for you guys. Uh, <laughs> you'll but, be you'll uh, be polishing your but, island. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But uh, but looking at it, I mean, we hold Sassel in, in in the portfolio at the moment as well. Um, and yeah, I, I think 
there, there is, it, it, it all comes down to your waiting. It comes down, you know, it's so difficult to answer that question. I mean, people always ask that question, should I sell, should I, mm. you know, how big is your position in your portfolio? What kind of exposure do you yeah, have? Yeah. You, you are sitting on a nice pro profit at the moment. I don't know whether sassel has got another 20, 30% to run. We haven't sold it out of portfolios yet, uh, but certainly I think, I think if you're sitting on a nice profit, uh, these are very cyclical industries. Uh, things can turn around very, very quickly and you might be left regretting the fact that you didn't just take a little bit of the money off the table. So yeah, that's a good point. I would probably say sell, sell, out, sell out a little bit mm -hmm. of the position, but that, that's again, when you're working with a portfolio manager, we, we would have to look at it in the context of your overall portfolio um, to see whether that is even a smart idea or not. But uh, I, it, because it's always very difficult, like the, the real, and this is what I just kind of want to maybe address in this question as well. The real skill of having a portfolio manager or managed portfolio is not necessarily just making super buy and sell calls. That's that's not what, what makes you a great portfolio manager. It's it's all the little extra things that you do. It's it's the little bit extra cost you get there. It's a little bit of an extra, extra execution you get there. It's um, you, you know, it's it's all it's all the different aspects that go in. It's, it's how does the correlation in your portfolio look to other things? There's there's a lot more that goes into portfolio management than just. I mean, hey, listen, great buy and sell calls also help. Sure, sure. <laughs> it's, it's not let's not let's not mince our words. But uh, yeah, I, I would say yeah, Sassel at this stage. Um, Light, lightening would probably be the right. I certainly wouldn't be adding that sort of portfolio. Yeah, and I take your point on that, Gary. It, it, yeah, and it's someone to 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 hold your hand when when markets are doing what they're doing so far this year. Um, and it, you know, if if if, if Sassel is your only commodity and it's a small position, that's fine. But if you've got Sassel and 19 other commodities and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, and Sassel is 40%, it's a different answer. Um, which is to your point whether whether portfolio manages it. Folks, we have hit time. Uh, you always uh, welcome. You can find obviously Ranswiss.com. Gary is on Twitter. Gary Boyson. Rand Swiss is on Twitter. We'll take more questions there. I have been load shed, so this video is only going to go up uh, sometime tomorrow morning. I'm going to go and try and find some dinner somewhere. Gary, always appreciate, always uh, great insights, great presentations, uh, and uh, great timing. Hit it a spot on time. Thank you for your time. Ladies and gents, appreciate your time this evening. Uh, everyone, uh, stay safe. And uh, if you're in cold parts of the country, which is probably everywhere except Durban, stay warm. <laughs>